Okay, so here we are within the Lataba bush camp in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. You guys have to come see what I just found. Cut. First, let me lock the door because we are in the middle of wild, wild Africa. Actually, last night we saw a leopard, a lion and a hyena during a night drive. And today we drove here to Lataba and it's absolutely beautiful. It's super hot though here in Africa and we're on the most southern part of Africa. And I came from reception and I found this amazing place that I have to go show you. So let's just go this way. But as we're walking, look over there. This is so epic. So every Friday night and Saturday night, the camp actually shows wildlife documentaries to people and kids that come to the camp. I think that is so, so cool. And just look here. Look at these beautiful, beautiful aloes. These aloes are really, really so gorgeous. Hey, hang on, come here. Also here at the park, there's so many um, information boards and educational parts, and they really take you through all of the information about the animals, but in most particular at this camp, they talk a lot about the elephants and the significance of the elephants and who the elephants are, why they are here, what has happened to them, natural threats, everything and that's kind of why i want to go show you something also we're passing an information board here all about world rhino day we haven't seen any rhinos and i'm sure many of you know that the rhinos in the wild are threatened by poachers especially for their horns so i hope we, we will see some rhinos but before we go in just take a glimpse Take a look around, it is so beautiful. But before I go there, I wanna show you something. Oh, there's a big lizard. I'm climbing here in the garden. Now, this is very strange. I don't know if you've seen um, flowers like this before, but these flowers, if I smell them, Oh, <coughs> they smell like dead meat. So disgusting. And that's what they do. This is their adaptation. They not only look beautiful, but they, they have a very strange adaptation to give off a type of smell which attracts flies and uh, all sorts of creatures. And then as soon as those insects come, they close them up. It's very similar to a Venus flytrap and they are very, very sneaky. So ooh, it really stinks. So I just wanted to show you guys this because this is, this is quite amazing to think that you see um, this flower, but actually in all of its beauty, it has a very disgusting smell. So really, really cool. Let's go around and see if that bird is still there. Just want to hop over here in the garden. There's so many succulents here. It's quite fascinating. Oh, there it is. It's sitting down drinking water. You can see its beak is open because it's extremely hot and it opens its beak to cool down. I'm not sure what bird it is, but they are here to drink water and to cool down. Let's just be very quiet. I don't want to scare it away. It will also sit here to see which insects come to drink water and they will just dive down and, and catch them. Oh, I see so many flies. These plants are fascinating. These animals are fascinating. I see at the tip of, of their wings, of the wings of this bird, One is passing, just around the corner, down, down, down. Go down here. Okay, wait. 
Just hang on. Okay, we need to camouflage. So right there, now I know why they are here. So these birds came over to take a bath. It seems like they are a couple, a male and a female. Makes such a beautiful sound. Ah, she's going back, she's going back. She's going back into the water. She's out. I think if we if we bend down here, and if they don't see us, they'll go back to the water. I really feel like a lizard now. I think they'll jump back. It's so hot. There's no way that they even want to leave the water pool. Okay, she's going back to the water. She's checking for any predators around and back into the water. Oh, look at that. Just taking a nice swim. I definitely need to find out what bird this is. It seems like it can be some type of sparrow. And at the edges of the wing, there's a lot of brown. On the top, there's almost an emerald green color. Oh my goodness. This is a man-made pool. And inside here, there's a terrapin. And this morning, where's the terrapin? I'm literally climbing into the jungle here to see what else I can find. Still, still, the two birds are as curious as I am. Look, now they're just sitting on the rock looking at me. Well, I'm as curious as you guys are. You can just keep on swimming. I want to look for the terrapin, okay? This is actually so beautiful. And when you're able just to be here in nature, and when your intentions are clear and pure, you can share a very symbiotic, mutual relationship with, with nature. Here I am, I'm sitting at the edge of the pond. I have nothing to do with the birds. I do not want to harm them. And they get on with what they want to do, and I get on with my inquiry about the terrapin oh i saw it it went that way but it's very 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 small but also i don't know if you can look inside the water but there's quite a lot of things inside this water um i can see some water nymphs water skippers i see some tadpoles it seems like it's a it's a it's quite a thriving ecosystem inside of this water, even for the terrapin to, to be here. And yeah, it's really, really cool. Now, while I'm trying to look for the terrapin, I'm just gonna watch this bird taking its bath. Oh. They are so... That's really, that's really interesting. They just took turns to take a bath. So now the other bird will be on the lookout and will take its time to dry and it will be watching to see that nothing dangerous comes. And the next one will just go and have, have a bath. So fair share, they're taking, they're taking turns. And this is a small baby baobab, but we've seen some really, really beautiful baobabs. And on the South African tree list, it's number 467. These guys are upside down trees. They are quite magnificent. Now, before we go into the surprise, I also want to point out 
these boxes over here. They are bat houses and the bats come and they nest inside there. And many people think, for example, something like a bat is an invasive species or it's something that we should kill and, and chase away, but not at all. They have a very, very important part in the ecosystem, in the, the distribution of, um, of seeds and fruits that, that they eat, but also they can help control the population of insects. And strangely enough, right over here, if you're, if you're interested in seeing one, right under here, there's actually a bat. So I just don't want to touch it with my hands and I just want to turn it over. It's really beautiful. Look at the back. If you see in there, you can see the spine. You can see the feet. Wow, it's really beautiful and their tails. It almost looks similar to to the skeleton of of a mouse or or a rat so i'm really curious about who they are in in the world of evolution maybe they were they were or maybe they are flying mice and before we go in i want you just to take notice of this mushroom because we're going to talk a little bit about mycelium and mushrooms and how this all comes together with regards to elephants, which I know might be a bit strange. So, are you ready? Close your eyes. Close your eyes, don't look. Okay, come over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ten okay open your eyes look at that whoa so here we are at the taba we are about to enter the environmental education center here at the Lataba bush camp and it's going to have a lot of information about elephants and different other species so i hope you guys are ready because i'm so excited come on let's go that massive oh this is probably the size of an adult elephant and some of them can even get bigger than that. Oh wow, a cycad. These plants are actually known as prehistoric plants, dinosaur age plants. So let's have a look here. The Goldfield Environmental Education Center, officially opened by Robin A. Plumridge, chairman and the chief executive officer of Goldfields on the 28th of August, 1993. Whoa, that's really interesting. Look at this. It's bursting open at its seams, at the seams. Oh, can I just give you a hug? Oh. gonna pause here for a moment and really really realize that we're here on a beautiful living planet and we share this beautiful eco ecosystem across continents so here we go environmental education center guys ready as we go in just look up look at this roof all of this grass are locally sourced it's called a thatch roof and even these old stumps, uh, a lot of the time elephants push these trees over and they just really reuse upcycle, if I can say it, environmentally eco, eco upcycle all of these beautiful trees and they use them as supporting pillars in, in the structures. So never waste anything. Let's go in. Okay, I might, I might talk a little bit softer now that we enter. Uh, the facility but it's still worth showing you guys so I know you're probably looking at that big elephant but come over here let's start from the beginning so let's start here I won't be able to read all of the information and I won't be able to touch on every every single part but I think we can still take the 15 minutes before they close to go into some of the detail. Now, first of all, here we start with the anatomy and physiology of the African elephant. And you can see it has all the body parts 
similar to us as humans. It's really, really fascinating. Something that is very interesting here, one way to distinguish between a mom and a dad, a male or a female, is to look at their heads, the shape of their heads. I did not know that. The female's forehead is more squared and angular. And did you know that the male's head is more rounded? I did not know that. That's really, really cool information. And here you can read a lot of information about their ears, their, their glands, their musts, a lot of cool stuff. Okay, let's move over here. Morphology. Now, currently I am based in Bali, which is in Asia. Bali is in Indonesia. And it's really interesting because this poster talks about the comparison between Asian and African elephants. And you can see here, if you come closer, the Asian elephants look quite different to the elephants that we find here in Africa. Their whole body part. A lot of these um, elephants are the ones that you would see, for example, in, in Thailand. But the African elephant, their ears, their tusks, their, their legs, their trunks, it's a lot different. You can also see, <laughs> you can fit a lot of elephants into a big blue whale. Now, this is also cool because later on we'll look at some teeth and how these teeth are formed and replaced. And that's really interesting because without the teeth, the elephant cannot eat and they cannot grind their food, which means if they don't have their teeth, they won't be able to survive. And at A, here in the front, similar to me and you, they have their crowns and um, of the lamella of, uh, and of the molar and there's three fragments and the roots are resorbed into the lower jaw. And then at B, as the molars develop, they are laid down as individual lamella that make up the new tooth. As they are produced, they move forward and upward. So it's almost a circular event in the teeth. They form, reform, move forward, come up. Form, reform, come forward, go up. And then here you can see the African elephant has a very different pattern as opposed to the Asian elephant. And there can be a lot of reasons for that, mostly because of their diet. diet. Um, and this here at number C, and just pause back there. The continuous remodeling of the bone occurs in the lower jaw and allows the molars to migrate forward through the jaw. Now, I have to tell you guys, we don't have a lot of time to go through, so let's quickly, quickly, quickly scan through. Here you can see the heart of the elephant. These are the, the um, coronary artery within the, the heart of the elephant and this is actually a real real preserved elephant heart it's really fascinating and here this is where the brain of the elephant sits look inside the skull this is where the brain goes it goes right in the forefront okay this way elephant growth growth So you can see the elephants grow rapidly from about 10 kilograms at, the, at their birth within 138 days all the way up to 120 kilograms by the time that they are 22 uh, months old. I don't think that was correct. You should cut that out. Right, let's have a look over here. Elephant growth. I'm gonna walk growing with an elephant. So imagine when an elephant is only one year old, they will be able to lean on their back and let's walk together. As they grow older, within three years, I can't actually reach onto the elephant anymore. And then within six years, I have a problem. <laughs> and then 
when they are adults, look at this. This would be my size as an adult next to a fully grown elephant. Oh, it's so fascinating. Come look here. So elephants can actually run up to 30 kilometers per hour. That is very, very fast. There's so many beautiful um, parts within this museum that I wish I could share. And if you look at the elephant's feet, look at that. They are so magic and so majestic and so mammothly ma massive. I can hardly talk about them. Um, within the, the, the big, big stomp, so within this very big foot pad, this is a, a, a back leg, a hind foot, there is a very um, interesting bone structure, similar to us as humans. So they don't just have one big bone or one big stomp. It's not as if they just have one leg in here. They have a very intricate uh, bone structure within, within their, their foot pad. And also, they have toenails, just like us, just like humans. And they are mammals, they have fur, they give their babies milk, and they give live birth. Now, here, this is the big thing, the tusks of the elephants. And this is called ivory, and this is something that gets um, hunted. Elephants are hunted for, for their tusks. And a lot of elephants on a yearly basis actually lose their lives uh, through poachers that come and just kill them, shoot them, poison them, put them in traps, cut off their trunks or just cut off their, their tusks and then use it for all sorts of medicinal uh, purposes. But come, let's go this way. Oh, the mushrooms. So the mushrooms, the dung beetles, they all work together to form uh, a beautiful ecological system. Now, I have to go through a little bit faster. There's a lot of information about the feeding of elephants, their diet, their feeding habits, the dung, the dung beetles. Oh, just look here. So how the dung beetles take the dung, they take the elephant dung, bring it into the soil, they lay their eggs inside there, and it's a beautiful process that happens over and over again. If we can do a quick scan here, actually, look here. Remember I told you about the teeth? Quickly look over here. So from nine months old, you can see the teeth are quite sunken down and very, very small. And then as the jaw grows bigger and as the elephant progresses, the teeth also changes. And you can see how the gray pushes the blue forward and forward and forward and forward. And it just grows and grows and the pattern is the same from from the beginning from birth all the way to the end and here you can constantly see how they reform push forward push out reform push forward push out and i'm actually going to show you some real elephant teeth if you are ready just come over to this side now i'm not going to touch the elephant because if a lot of people come here over and over and over and you should remember this when you go to any museum it is really important not to touch any of the specimens because if we do that over a long period of time it will also harm the specimens which means we can't keep them for a long time but quickly jump here this room is magical but wait before we go in here this has been probably my most favorite part of the whole whole elephant education or environmental education center and it's all about how do they die do they only die through people or are there other uh, possibilities for for elephants to to get into trouble or to pass away so come on have a look here some of the the natural causes can be because of their aggressive behavior where elephants, and especially here you can see this one, can attack and fight each other and that can be fatal. So this skull is on display because it was found in the north of the Kruger Park, this park that we're in now, in 1988. Judging from the position, if you look up here, 
judging from the position and the angle of the entry of the tusk, the victim must have been forced down on his knees and that tusk was penetrated through the skull, through the eyes, which have made that elephant to die. So here you can also see they can be very, very aggressive and with their massive body weight and the amount of force, it's quite crazy. Many elephants die as a result of natural causes. So it's not that humans are their only threat. They are live, wild, living creatures. So a lot of environmental factors also contribute to, to their uh, mortality. And here you can see, once an elephant gets into a fight and they perhaps break their tusk, that can be detrimental for, for them into the future because they need those tusks to protect themselves. And as I said earlier, here is a tooth, a real, real elephant tooth. And you can see from the model that we saw earlier, the pattern is still visible, right? But this is an elephant tooth of an elephant that passed away from old age. Down here, you can still see all the original teeth um, intact, but this elephant died over, um, from, from old age. Sometimes the elephants make their elephant graveyards and there's a popular myth about elephant graveyards. And elephants are known, however, to cover their fallen um, babies or comrades with, with branches and debris, which I didn't know. And other dead animals, including lion or even trampled hunters, may also be subjected to such attentions. Okay, last thing, they can pass away because of diseases, injuries, droughts, and abnormalities. These are all parts um, that can contribute to the mortality rate of, of elephants. Now, before we go, because I know the time's up, I just want to quickly take you in here. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come, come, come. Just look at this. Now, before you think, oh my goodness, a lot of dead animals, I want you just to stop, take a deep breath, and really think about what you're witnessing here. You're not witnessing a lot of dead animals. You are witnessing science in motion. You are witnessing conservation, passed in time and space for education. So a lot of these animals inside here, if not all of them, have been either uh, conserved because of natural causes or they've been conserved after um, some sort of mortality through disease or drought or, or any of those previous parts that we've spoken about. But now they are here for us to study, to learn, to read, to look, to observe. And I think this is really, really fascinating. There's no need for us to throw any of these animals or any of these artifacts away. But it is a golden opportunity for us to come together and to know more about this beautiful, absolutely amazing, fascinating world that we all share. Do you know right now, currently on this day, you are sharing the world with an alligator, with a crocodile, somewhere in Africa, or somewhere in America, or somewhere in Asia. That's really fascinating. Now, I also want to bring you all the way here. And I'm going to quickly lie down. I'm going to put my feet at the beginning. I'm going to stretch my arms all over. And I'm almost the length almost the length of that elephant tusk. Ah, is that possible? Again, if you read here, it says, do not move. This is a fiberglass tusk. Do not touch, which means they've made a replica of this tusk to show us what the actual tusks look like. It will be very dangerous to keep a real tusk in here because these tusks a lot of poachers and a lot of people want these tusks for their value. So, oh, I'm coming right up and I'm looking straight into the baboon skull. This is so beautiful. And look, here's one of the small five, a leopard tortoise. 
Now their shell has a very st distinct pattern on top of them and they um, are, are one of the small five and their shell looks like leopard spots, hence their name, the leopard tortoise. Above me you can see a beautiful lion hide that's been preserved over time and here you can see a small baby fetus lion again for science purposes sometimes these uh, baby lions get born with uh, dysfunctions or they get prematurely born and then what the rangers and the scientists do they conserve this for us to be able uh, to look at them for educational purposes and if you look over to here, it's a zebra. Now, I don't know if you know this, but that is like a barcode. And the baby zebra, as soon as they see their mom, they know exactly that those stripes belong to their mom. They can stand in a herd of a hundred zebras and they will exactly know which zebra mom is their mom. I did not know that and that's really, really cool. Buffalo over here. I'm just gonna point a little bit. A puff adder, hippopotamus skull. Ooh, I'm sure many of you also know this is the hippo skull. I know I'm going fast. Their teeth are as interesting. And this guy is a warthog. And if you've watched Lion King, this is Pumbaa. So this is what Pumbaa's skull would look like. A tracking collar. They put this around the legs of the elephants to track them, to keep them safe, to know where they are, so that they don't go missing, or um, if they if they don't see them for a long time, that they might be poached or, or anything like that. So these these are very important um, methods of of knowing what's happening. Giraffe. Yep. Did you know that's all bone? It's not hair on top of their heads, although it's all very 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 compacted. The skull, gir giraffe, pelvic, pelvis. Ah, last thing before we go out here. If you feel your back right here, that is what it looks like inside the neck of an elephant. So if you think you can wake up with a very sore back, just imagine what that elephant should feel like. Now, Quick one minute, we're we'll do a circle and then we're out of here. And I just want to show you here, there are so many stories about the ivory trade, about hunting, about poaching, people that have put up anti-poaching units and that have been standing um, together to say, no, we cannot do this in this brutal way. We cannot treat animals in, in this way. And I think this is a, a movement that, that should keep happening and it all starts with us, with our conservation, with our compassion, with our empathy, with our awareness, with our communication about what we believe and how we believe we can conserve and sustain a regenerative future in the world of, of in environmental education. So again, I'm just showing you the enormity of of what these animals actually represent. It's fascinating. Something else, I don't know if you've ever built a trap or if you've ever made a trap to try and catch something, but if you look over here, what people used to do, they used to dig very, very big pitfalls and then the elephants would walk over them and they will fall inside or there will be a falling spear and then literally when the animal, <clears throat> when the elephant goes past the tree, the spear will penetrate through the back of their head into their neck and they will, be, they will, they will die. Or there will be a wheel trap where the elephant uh, steps into a snare and they will get caught onto a big log and then it makes it easier for the poachers to, to shoot them. So somehow we as, as humans, we've become so creative, so innovative in such a brutal, detrimental way. And I really challenge you, if you're watching this, to think of alternative ways to be creative, alternative ways to be innovative, not in this brutal, detrimental way, in a way that we can really look forward to fair share, to earth care, to 
how can we regenerate our, our planet and not just destroy and take, take, take? I can feel my whole body get so excited to, to know that we have a chance to rethink conservation. We have a chance to rethink a whole world where we live in harmony, in absolute harmony with animals, with plants, with the earth. It does not have to be this binary. It does not have to be um, humans on the one side and nature on the other side. It is a co-creation. It is that magic middle right at the center that we are looking for. So with that, I am saying goodbye to this really, really, really awesome environmental uh, education center. And I can really thank the people, the rangers, the conservation of South African national parks for creating spaces like this, where not only young people and not even old people, but anybody, even people like me in the middle, can come, can learn, can celebrate, can remember, can recreate, can redesign the future of environment, of education, and co-create what that means. So, I challenge you to join the social structure, not only of, of animals, but even for us as humans, to see how can we build a better society? How can we be better communicators? How can we be better at interacting? And how can we use all of this to change our behavior towards one another and towards a better future? Come, let's put down our name. All the way from Indonesia, Bali. And I'm writing down my comment is earth, care, future, and love. And that is a wrap. Hi, it's Peter Nicolene from Tamed and Untamed Studio. As usual, if you enjoyed our content, give us a shout out so that we can create especially what you would like to see next. And don't forget to leave a comment below. Bing, bing, bing.